All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon. As chair, I now call to order the November 13th, 2023 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Baltimore, excuse me, of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Walsh, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be ma maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to, der to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you. Ms. Frempong? Present. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Present. Thank you. Dr. Savoy? Ms. Stalusky? Present. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Please call the roll to determine which staff members are present in the meeting. Sure. Dr. Jones? Here. Thank you. Dr. Augusto? Uh, Mr. Augusto, present? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Ms. Howie? Here. Thank you. And Ms. Wash? Here. All right, I will hand the meeting back over to you, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Item B, item, the first item on our agenda is policy 50, excuse me, 5550 and 5560. Um, they were added to the 2021-2022 PRC schedule at the request of Ms. Hen and carried over to the 2022-2023 PRC schedule. However, the PRC did not have sufficient time on its schedule to discuss these policies. They are before the committee today for discussion to determine whether the committee wants a review of these policies. I have asked Ms. Howie to explain the background and PRC history. Then Dr. Jones will give an overview of the policies. Ms. Howie will, oh, thank you, sorry. No worries, thank you, uh, Ms. Pumphrey and members of the committee. Just to give you some background about how 5550 and 5560 were uh, addressed during the 21, 22 and 22, 23 school year. At the March 14th, 2022 uh, PRC meeting, uh, the policies were on the agenda to be discussed as they related to the legal requirements, both from 7305 of the education article and the Code of Maryland regulations. Uh, the committee did not get to the discussion at that meeting and uh, the discussion was postponed. At the June 6, 2022 meeting, uh, at the request of Ms. Hen, the policies were added to the 22-23 schedule. And then at the September 19, 2022 meeting, the policies were delayed again, but at that time it was requested that a committee discuss the policies. The committee was never formed. Uh, that committee would have been Ms. Hen, um, the previous student board member, and it was indicated anyone else who was interested, as well as yours truly. Uh, the committee never got off the ground, so the question now is what the uh, what the committee what this committee wishes to do, and Ms. or Dr. Jones is here to explain uh, just an overview of the policies themselves, and I'll leave it to Dr. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Good evening, everyone. Members of the committee, as you are aware, policies 5550 and 5560 address student discipline. 5550 is the student behavior code and 5560 outlines the process for student suspension and expulsion. 5550 explains the what, that is what behavior is prohibited in schools on school property during field trips. And 5560 explains the how how consequences for violations of 5560 will be handled. Thank you.
Thank you. Is there any discussion on whether there is a need for review of policy 5500 and excuse me, 5550 and 5560? Um, I, I don't see anyone else raising a hand at the moment, but I think um, Based on some public comment, I think we probably do need to review the at least have a discussion on these policies. I'm not sure. Um, I guess the question was whether we want staff to revise or take no further action. Is that correct, Ms. Howie? Those are two of the options. Obviously, there are other options uh, that the committee would have. Uh, whether or not you wish to discuss them within a particular context. What is it that you need as far as moving forward? OK, so my my concern is that um, and I know this is partial or probably mostly rule and implementation um, as far as consistency across schools uh, reg um, for the pol for for the policies as far as consequences. Um, I know I've heard from uh, from the public as far as consistency across schools, and I'm not sure if that's something that we can address in policy so that we're being more specific um, as far as our consequences. Um, I mean, you know, in the policy itself so that there's consistency across the board with implementation. So I, I guess what other, what other committee members, how other committee members feel as well. So, Ms. Pumphrey, are there specific examples that you have of uh, there being inconsistent implementation uh, of the the policies? So that staff can at least be directed um, in any review. Sure, let me take a look here. And why I'm, why I'm looking, um, Ms. Selesky, did you have a comment? Thank you, um, and Ms. Pumphrey, you did bring up a great point. Um, one, just a side to make, I know sometimes because of confidentiality, parents either assume or feel that consequences aren't given because they're not kept informed of the what, the how, the person's name, et cetera. So I know that I don't know if there's anything we can do about it because of confidentiality, um, but of course parents do feel as though they're left in the dark, that you know something worthy of a consequence happens in the school. The, the letter is sent out that states, I'm paraphrasing, but that appropriate consequences will be given, but parents feel in the dark because they really don't know what's being done. And I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but in terms of transparency, if there was any way to provide something, um, I think, and I know that's kind of new and innovative because all school systems all across the country deal with the same confidentiality issue. Um, but there is this sense from the public that the the policies aren't being for enforced or as Ms. Pumphrey said, there's just this big inconsistency. So it, I, I guess this is more just of a comment because I don't know what could be done differently to to prove to parents that yes, these these policies in terms of 5560 with how they're implemented is being enforced. I, I just don't know if there's anything we could do. And uh, Ms. Tlesky, I'm certainly willing to research the issue, but my immediate answer is no. Yeah. Uh, that let's say, for example, that a student um, violates the student behavior code, uh, and let's say it's a category three. Um, so it is it, as to whether or not that student was suspended or expelled, to release that information is a violation of that right. student's right to privacy um, and that student's statutory rights. Right. So no, <laughs> uh, again, my that's my immediate 
Uh, I'm happy to see whether or not there are any cases or regulations that go in the opposite direction, but yeah. my very strong ivory 99.9% um, uh, thought is that no. Right. And and again, I just was sort of adding on to Ms. Pumphrey. I think as consequences are better enforced, the trust by the public that we are consistent will increase. And then those doubts that are seated among the community will will be reduced, if that makes sense. In other words, as we get to a point where classroom management and, and student behavior improves, then the trust by the public will increase. And as their trust in the school system in being consistent increases, those doubts of feeling that things aren't being enforced would reduce. I know I'm so. Yeah, I, 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 it's I a mean, point, I, and my example sort of relates to that, that I finally came, come to, came to mind. Um, for example, a student fighting in school and then the next day the student is present in the classroom. When right. you know, that would, I, I think the language says it may call call for suspension. Right. Um, and, and I know some of those, I know some of this language would change from shall to may based on state law, um, you know, and um, zero tolerance, that type of thing. Um, but are there instances where we can be specific and say this will happen if this, you know, if for this offense, this is what's going to happen? I completely agree because our job is to restore trust by the community that the, the parents and community members trust that this school system will be consistent and there is some predictability with the consequences and and i agree anything we can do to change maybe the language where it can be a black and white consequence would serve us well to do so and in the same manner we don't want to take discretion away from our administrators i'm not trying to say that but i even to make it easier on them so they know this you know this is what happens at each school across the system when we can do that when it makes sense when it's right. legal most, yeah. most importantly. Yes, no, I think that's a, a great idea. So you do have category three offenses uh, and you do have the uh, Gun Free Schools Act where by federal law, we're required to impose uh, discipline and expulsion or exclusion from school for up to one year. But I would just want to make sure you're aware of some constraints you have with saying everyone's going to get this particular uh, consequence. Right. The most striking example is for our special needs students. So prior to imposing discipline, what has to happen by federal law is that we have to determine whether or not the action, so the disciplinary infraction, uh, is uh, a manifestation of that individual student's disability. If it's a manifestation, then we cannot impose discipline under 5560. So that student who may be in class the next day, I I'm not sure if that's one of the reasons, uh, but that is definitely a possibility. We would not be able to exclude that student from their educational program if it is found that the the action was a manifestation so there actually has to be a meeting convened to review the student's iep and this and the student's behavior in light of his or her disability okay and maybe it's more of a communication thing where we i mean we talked we talked about this in another um, in another meeting about you know, sometimes I think the public doesn't always know the reasoning behind things um, and it, even, you know, some type of this is why, you know, did you know type of thing for for the public. This is why you may not hear about consequences, you know, because of uh, confidentiality. This is why things may, may be inconsistent from one school to another. Um, I'm not sure how to go about doing that, but it's almost more after what you said, I'm thinking of it more of as a communication so that the public is aware of why they may see inconsistencies from school to school. I don't know how we address that and it may not be a PRC issue, but that just came to mind after what you just said, Ms. Howie. 
um, then in some ways there may be, you know, uh, some some information that we need to get out to the public so that they're more aware of why they may see these inconsistencies. So, um, Ms. Pumphrey, members of the committee, is that something that you'd like Dr. Jones um, and uh, and PRC committee staff to review and bring back to you our recommendations? I think so. Any other comments from committee members? Oh, I see. I can barely see your hand, Ms. Zaleski. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. I think you bring up a great point, even to the degree about some of the laws, you know, that the lower elementary school children cannot be suspended. And, and here's why. And then um, some of those special education um, stipulations that you just mentioned. As much as we could possibly share, I do think that that is a really transparent step to take. So I do agree. That was a great idea. OK, thank you. Do you have enough to move forward, Ms. Howie, you and your staff at this point? I believe so. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next item on our agenda is policy 5140, special permission transfer. And for that, I call again on Dr. Jones. Thank you. Members of the committee, policy 5150 special permission transfer is being presented to you this evening for readoption. Staff is not recommending any changes to the policy, which permits students to apply for transfers to schools other than their home school. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Is there any discussion on the recommended changes? Well, there are no recommended changes. Is there any discussion regarding policy 5140? OK, seeing none, um, policy 5140 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Uh, next on our agenda is policy 5552, use of personal electronic communication devices by, by students. Policy 5552 was added to PRC schedule at my request. It is, it is before the committee today for discussion to determine whether there is a need to revise policy 5552 or whether there is an implementation issue with the policy. Uh, before um, I think this came forward, I, I I believe as far as the cell phone policy, and I I we um, uh, the superintendent and staff ha at the beginning of the school year did move forward with some push as far as implementation and consistency across schools um, that I think all of uh, that I think board members were aware of and saw, and you know we we got some really good public feedback and comment regarding um, how the implementation was going throughout our schools. Um, so I, I do think that we, I'm not sure that, I don't believe that there are any changes that need to be made. I think we wanted to make sure that implement, implementation was the way it should be. Um, that was my understanding. Um, and I'd love to hear from board members if you have any other comments. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. Harvey. Yes. I, I, I do think we need to give the system time uh, to ensure consistent implementation. We do know that some changes have been um, implemented so far, that there are some other precautions to put in place to help students The forget what they're called, the little boxes, bags that kids can put their phones in who are particularly having difficulty uh, managing the temptation to use them. So I would I would think changes to the policy might be a little premature and that we should give this, this system time to implement their strategies and make sure there's uh, fidelity in the implementation and see what kind of results we get. I would agree with Ms. Harvey. Any other comments from committee members? Ms. Selesky? Yeah, one thought that I had, and I, I do agree that um, we we need time. Um, and some of you were at the MABE conference where the student panel um, answered questions. And one of the questions was, what should schools do about cell phones? And the panel was all high school students, just to be they probably juniors or seniors. Um, each panel member 
was the student member of the board for their respective county. But it was just interesting. There was a wide range of, of what should be done, whether it's all day in school, whether it's not in class, but free phone use during lunches and change of classes. But the message overall was these high school students were saying what a distraction it would be with phones in class, you know, that for the cafeteria, for the hallways, it was fine, but but there was pretty widespread agreement of how detrimental the phones are during instruction, which to hear that from teenagers, I thought was really eye-opening. I wonder if one possible thing that we could do perhaps while we let the policy play out is maybe some quick survey monkey or other survey um, sent out to teachers. You know, we could figure out, do we just do teachers or possibly teachers and parents? Just sort of a quick check-in um, just to make sure that we're on the right track. It's just one thought that I had. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slosky. And I was present for that um, conversation as well. It was very eye-opening because the students themselves, even about their own cell phone usage, you know, that if there is proper policy or rules implemented um, and they weren't distracted by their phones, they felt better that way. Whereas they, if they felt like they had free range, they were always distracted um, to, you know, with just the thought of being, having that in front of them to be able to use when they, whenever they wanted. So it was, it was pretty eye-opening to hear from the students themselves. Any other comments? This is board member from Tom. Okay. Um, so if I heard the, um, I guess, comment about teachers and parents, but maybe this is also an opportunity to hear from our own students as well. Uh, maybe some more insight regarding this. And we have our student member, Kayla Drummond, um, and she has started having town hall meetings. She just had one last week. So maybe even again, kind of getting some feedback from our students and our system as well. Um, and having Kayla help us with that initiative to hear more about um, what students in our particular county um, think about that or, or even that whole implementation. Of, are there some thoughts that they could share um, that might be better in helping to make sure that the cell phones are being used when they're supposed to, but then yet, of course, our young people, they want their freedom. So having, you know, some kind of structure around what that freedom is as far as when it is, when it is appropriate to use the cell phones. Thank you, Ms. Frampong. So at this point, I think we are um, at the, at, as far as the policy is concerned itself, um, sort of delaying discussion as far as whether or not it needs to be revised to see how the new implementation goes throughout the year. Um, is that is that what I'm hearing? Uh, and this is Mrs. Harvey that I, I'm in agreement with that. OK. So um, members of the committee, would you like this brought back to you, say, in May? I think that's June? a good idea that kind of gives us throughout the school year to see how, how implementation is going and we can revisit at that point. OK. Um, staff will put it back on the calendar for that time. Thank you. And for our next item, um, we have an update on our artificial intelligence discussion. Um, the committee has requested that Mr. Augusto provide an update. Um, and so, Mr. Augusto, whenever you're ready, you can proceed. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> Members of the committee, uh, what I'm doing today is I'm going to give you three data points and then um, kind of weave out the theme of the three data points to help answer, give some updates to artificial intelligence. So first data point is, uh, I'm just going to give you a timeline of what happened um, <clears throat> in New York City, the Public Schools Department of Education there. So so we know in November of 2021, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, November 2022, OpenEye launched ChatGPT. And just a little clarification, so in January, 
of 2023, New York City Public Schools, they restricted access. So they didn't ban it outright, but they restricted the access to, uh, of Jet GPT to staff and students by request only. It then gave them time because they realized at that point they needed to figure out what they were going to do with this new technology. So they convened um, a group consisting of uh, tech industry leaders, which one of the outcomes of that meeting, uh, they currently have, uh, they, they partnered with Microsoft to uh, create an AI chatbot that's being used by New York City as a whole, um, which is one of the use cases that um, is used for chat or for uh, generative AI, and that's the ability to do self-service chatbots where the chatbot can answer questions um, in natural language format. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, New York City did reach out <coughs> to its educators uh, with the idea that um, they would have um, insight into um, ideas and use cases for um, lesson planning. Uh, so what they did is they went out, they reached out to teachers <clears throat> within their own district. They put together best practices and they actually put together um, um, sample plans for uh, and how to use uh, generative AI within the school setting. So then in May of 2023, they did announce that they were opening it back up. Now, that's one data point. I also reached out to Gartner, uh, and if uh, for those who are not familiar with Gartner, Gartner is a, um, uh, a strategic um, analysis group they do they put out research papers um, they provide uh, counseling for um, a myriad of strategic issues in IT and beyond um, I did reach out to Gartner to talk about um, AI in K-12 in particular and um, they did have uh, they put together a, a kind of a skeleton of what their recommendations were for reviewing generative AI in K-12. So a good thing is it's it's mirroring it's what was done over in New York City. So the first step they're saying is to uh, have an understanding. So build the basic understanding of the Gen AI principles and tools, which is the presentation I gave last PRC and the discussions we've been having fits <clears throat> in with that step putting together familiarity with the benefits, risks, and implementation in K-12. So just basing any future decisions on sound foundation and facts around AI. The next um, step is to develop board policies and or tweak guidelines that you may have, uh, work on professional development with staff, and put together any risk mitigation strategies based on the understanding that you've garnered based on risks and implementation of generative AI. Next step is to prepare to so identify the organization's top priorities, develop those use cases uh, for generative AI um, with a focus on those top AI interface benefits. And then um, again, we've been focusing our discussion on chat GPT and other others other of those generative AI tools that can be used by students at home or on personal devices. But there's a myriad of AI features and functions that are being implemented as we speak in software that's being used in K-12. So one of the recommendations they had is to identify those existing systems with um, AI that are available now, understand um, with our vendors, the product pipeline, see what they have um, in their pipeline for of implementation or expansion of AI. Um, <clears throat> once that is completed, then you run into the de deliverance stage, which is uh, implementing in a pilot, expanding it, experimenting with what you have, and then you evaluate how successful that pilot's going. You can assess evaluate and iterate from there. Um, and then the last one that I will put out, um, I'll put it in the chat. Um, it was part of the materials that Ms. Howie provided um, in, in some of the articles, but I went and pulled it out directly and it's the US Department of Education guideline 
on artificial intelligence and the future of teaching and learning. So it is a uh, good reading because it does lay out a guideline for um, implementation and it, it gives a, a broad understanding of AI. So that is, it, it's easier reading now that it's uh, pulled out from, from the article that it was in. But the point I want to make here is that all three data points um, do point to that uh, creation or modification of policy is recommended um, and that um, modification or creation should be based on a foundation, a good solid knowledge of AI, which I believe um, we are taking the right steps in doing so. Um, and you know, in my opinion, it warrants um, either updating the existing acceptable use policy or creating a, a separate policy around um, AI um, or slash emerging technologies because AI is the is the current technology today that um, the board is grappling with but um, a number of years from now there may be another emerging technology that may have an impact to k-12 thank you mr augusto You're welcome are there any questions for mr mr augusto based on his uh, presentation Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to clarify, are you recommending that we have a policy that the board consider establishing a policy on emerging technology in general, what our approach would be to the use of any emerging technology, or are you specifically saying uh, AI? Yes, no, I am saying, uh, it, it's a couple things, Ms. Harvey. So. Uh, there's currently a policy on acceptable uh, technology, a techno, technology acceptable use policy. Um, the first step would just review that policy. This again, my recommendation and my opinion on this, but we could review that policy to see if um, it is uh, expansive enough to encompass um, AI and emerging emerging technologies. If not, if the decision is made to to do a, a separate policy, then again, I, my recommendation would be if we're going to go through the effort of creating a separate policy, let's make that policy um, comprehensive enough that it can take care of or, or handle other emerging technology and, and not just have it focused on one technology, which is AI, right? If I'll put it this way. If we had that model, we would have had a policy, uh, you know, back in the uh, early 90s when we started wondering what we were going to do with the internet as a whole. Um, so those are just emergency, emerging technologies that are out there that, in my opinion, makes sense to just have a policy on emerging technologies that can handle just the process for evaluating technologies, um, what the uh, or the policy should be for BCPS for new technology, the evaluation, and with some guidelines for um, acceptance or implementation. Okay, oh, thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Augusto? Okay, so it sounds to, based upon Mr. Augusto's recommendation um, and what I'm hearing from Ms. Harvey, how do we feel, how does the committee feel about proceeding as far as reviewing um, the current acceptable use policy to see if it can be, uh, adjustments can be made to include, uh, or if it already includes the uh, appropriate um, uh, wording for artificial intelligence or any emergency, emerging technology, tech, excuse me, technological advances. Um, would the committee agree with that at this point? Yes, th this is Felicia Stileski. Can you restate that, please? Sure, I just, based upon our discussion um, or Mr. Augusto's recommendation, it sounds as if we should probably review the acceptable use policy that is that we currently have as far as artificial intelligence 
artificial intelligence to see if it needs to be modified to include um, some changes um, and looking at you know the research and the discussion that we've had around this area subject. Thank you. And then at that point, if we feel that a uh, new policy needs to be brought forward, we can we can proceed with that after our review of the acceptable use policy that we currently have. Is everyone in agreement with that? This is board member from Pong. Yes. So I guess I have a question. So this acceptable use policy, is this specifically governing the use of AI by students? Is it by staff, et cetera? Because I guess when I'm thinking about emerging technologies and AI specifically, I guess its use can cover a lot of different areas. I guess I'm trying to understand specifically then for this acceptable use policy, this is policy over what or what entity or what people in particular. Mr. Gusto, would you like me to answer that? Yes, um, since okay. you probably would have a better answer than I. Okay, so the TAUP uh, is something that all employees, all students, everyone who accesses BCPS technology uh, has to follow. So it's not just for students, it's also for employees. So for example, the TAUP um, tells us what we cannot do. So what's acceptable, also what's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to download illegal materials uh, on um, uh, through a BCPS device. Uh, and all of you as board members should have signed a TAUP um, when your email addresses uh, were issued to you. Anything to add, Mr. Augusto? Uh, no, and um, <coughs> spot on. Uh, the only thing I would add is, uh, Ms. Frempong, since as Ms. Howard just said, it does govern um, the accept acceptable uses, um, and with that, uh, what is not acceptable, um, the question is whether the, the language that is in place can be used uh, expanded to include um, in, at this point artificial intelligence um, and or again I'm just thinking down the road emerging technologies but uh, I agree there's there's a tech uh, the TAUP is there to govern this particular um, subject area. Ms. Howie, um, one, uh, this is Mr. Corns. Um, one uh, additional uh, piece that we have added, uh, every staff device uh, at login, um, the staff has to uh, click an OK button in order to get to the login that uh, states that uh, by logging into this device, they're accepting the terms of the acceptable use. And in addition, our BCPS guest network also has the same language presence so that by clicking OK, there's an acceptance of the acceptable use policy. Thank you, Mr. Corns. And I just put the staff uh, TAUP uh, link in the um, in the chat. This is Ms. Harvey. I, I think we need to review the acceptable use policy in conjunction with this policy because I think we may be, I'm not sure that we set the right horizon around what we're what we're seeking to place in policy. Uh, this started out as a discussion of, about cheating and the use of AI around cheating. Now we're talking about globally thinking about the impact on any emerging technologies. So I, I think we should probably compare uh, those two policies against each other to see where we may need to supplement them or grow them without reaching into the operational side of the house. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Howie is posting some additional some additional uh, the policies in 
the chat for us. So for the record, for those who um, will be listening to these since the, these are your minutes, it's policy 4104 is the staff um, TAUP and policy 6202 is what is applicable to students. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Any other comments from committee members? Ms. Howie, do you um, have enough information here as far as what the committee is requesting to move forward? I believe staff does, yes ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Augusto. Thank you. And may Mr. Augusto be excused? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a good evening. And I see Dr. Jones is still on, but I do see a question that um, may be directed to her. Yes, thank you for bringing that up to my attention because I didn't want to miss it and I almost did. So thank you, Ms. Alley. Um, Ms. Frempong, I believe, had, an, had a question going back to um, policy 5552, which was the um, use of personal electronic communication devices by students. Ms. Frempong, are you there still? I am here, thank you. You're welcome. I know you were um, having um, difficulties with your sound. I am, so thank you. Um, so I guess it was the question that I had. So we are tabling this. I do understand we decided that we were tabling this until May. Um, so I can ask this question again in May um, if you want me to, but I'm just going to go ahead and bring it up now. So one of the things that I was looking at specifically in policy 5552, I believe it was section 3H, um, and it talks about that communication to parents. And again, I think that's kind of this theme that we're hearing throughout this meeting and, and other meetings as far as communication to parents. So right now it says advised annually, and I guess I was just throwing out there, are we able to consider more frequent advising such as biannually? Um, I asked that question because I think about things like Christmas time where um, kids are receiving phones as gifts. Um, or even if we have new students coming in, um, you know, if this advisement has already been given on an annual basis, how or where are parents or students um, going to be notified of this information or policy simply because if they're coming from, you know, in another county, their policy might be different if they're coming out of state, might be different, et cetera. So that was just my comment about policy 5552 when we're able to actually get into that policy. Okay, so it sounds, uh, Ms. Rampong, so you're referencing um, sort of the information that went out at the beginning of the year to reinforce the implementation of the policy. I think that's what I'm hearing, that uh, maybe we could do that quarterly instead of just at the beginning of the year, just to reiterate to any new students or um, students that uh, get phones throughout the year to reiterate, excuse me, reiterate the um, rule throughout the schools. Is that correct? Yes, so right now it says annually, whatever that frequency is that the school system determines is appropriate. But I guess, yeah, just considering the um, there may be more opportunities to to share that that message with our students and parents as well, just because of different circumstances as people come into the system or, you know, again, Christmas time, of course, kids are getting new phones. OK, thank you. Good point there. Thank you. And I, thank you. Thank you. We made a note of that. OK, um, and the next item on our agenda is regarding gender guidance. There has been considerable comment and discussion at recent board meetings about gender issues that are facing the school system. Ms. Howie has offered to present a general overview of the law in this area. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, you'll just give me a moment to tee this up. Ms. Howie, I think your mic may be off. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. And are you able to see the slide deck? Yes, I can see it. Can everyone else see it? I think everyone else can see it, yes. 
Great, thank you. Members of the committee, uh, there have been questions about uh, gender and how it is um, uh, presented in Maryland law and how we address gender issues in BCPS. So this is an overview um, and a, a high level overview, if you will, about gender and BCPS. So what I want to discuss uh, this evening uh, is uh, some legal as well as regulatory and policy guidance uh, that we have. Uh, first from federal law, Title IX, and I'm, I've put Title VII in parens, and you'll, that'll become clear as we go forward. Uh, the federal district court decision in MAB versus Talbot County Board of Education uh, what the Code of Maryland regulations, specifically 13A0106 equity provides, as well as board policy 0100 on equity. And finally, your own board resolution um, on LGBTQ plus inclusivity, which was passed in 2022. Um, there are, in addition to uh, Title IX, or there is an addition to Title IX, two executive orders I wanted to make you aware of. And while executive orders do not have the force and effect of law, they do direct the, and in this case, directed the Department of Education specifically regarding how um, sexual orientation and gender identity were to be treated by the public schools. And it's on that basis that uh, the U.S. Department of Ed uh, expanded some of its guidance uh, as of 2021. There are rule changes that have been uh, going through the regulatory process for the past year and a half, I'd say, uh, based on these executive orders. And that brings us to Title IX, which seems to be very simple in the way it's presented, but uh, not, it has not always been interpreted that way. Title IX, uh, which was put in place in 1972, simply says that no person shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any education program that receives federal financial assistance. Uh, so again, it seems pretty simple. Initially, as it was understood and applied, uh, Title IX simply applied to uh, participation in sports and athletics. It has been expanded since that time. In 2020, uh, the US Supreme Court said that Title VII uh, which applies to employment prohibited discrimination because of sex, which prohibits discrimination because of sex, covers discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. And what the courts have done with Title IX and Title VII is to use some of the, um, the settled law in Title VII to explain what Title IX means. And that's exactly what happened in MAB versus Board of Education of Talbot County. In that particular case, um, which uh, was, and the opinion was issued in 2018, MAB was a student who attended St. Michael's Middle High School. Um, MAB's birth sex is female, but MAB had a male gender identity and asked to use the boys' locker rooms as well as the boys' restrooms. The school did provide to MAB three single-use use restrooms. The school then, after a Fourth Circuit opinion um, concerning use of restrooms, then permitted MAB to use the boys' restroom, but still said that MAB could not use the boys' locker room. MAB then sued um, Talbot County Board of Education, indicating that Talbot County had violated Title IX by not permitting him to use the boys' locker room. 
when this case was heard in the federal district court based on the the board of education's motion motion to dismiss the federal district court denied the board's motion to dismiss and ruled that denying access to the boys locker room was gender stereotyping that violated title IX. And what the uh, the court did was base its analysis of what gender stereotyping is by looking at Title VII cases, even though this was a Title IX case. After the board issue, or after the the federal district court issued its uh, opinion, the local board and students settled the case. But part of the settlement involved permanent access to restrooms, to locker rooms, and any other board-owned facilities that were designated for use by boys and by men. That brings us to the Code of Maryland Regulations, just to make sure you're aware that uh, the Educational Equity Regulation indicates that students uh, we have to consider students' individual characteristics and not uh, treat them differently because of them. And one of the individual characteristics named in Comar 13A01603 is gender identity. The State Department of Education has issued guidance on how um, to address gender issues. As you see, they go back to 2015. Um, which was when Dr. Jack Smith was uh, superintendent, uh, state superintendent of schools. And as of 2015, um, the State Department was very clear on how uh, we are to treat transgender and gender nonconforming youth. Since that time, there have been other guidances issued, notably in 2016 non-discrimination guidelines for student transitions, and then working with parents of transgender identifying youth. The Maryland Public School Secondaries Athletic Association has also issued guidelines on how transgender youth are to uh, participate in interscholastic athletics. Now to go back to the guidelines for gender identity non-discrimination, again, these have been um, on the, the state board's books since 2015. And as of 2015, what the, the State Department said was that we are to provide access to the restroom that corresponds to a student's gender identity and that um, the accommodation of single stall restrooms with locking doors uh, can be provided to students or offered to stu all students, not just students who are gender nonconforming. And then finally, to permit gender, transgender and gender nonconforming students uh, to use facilities of the gender of the gender that is most consistent with both their safety and their gender identity. Again, the guidelines from 2015 address locker rooms, uh, address non-stigmatizing private alternative space for any student who's uncomfortable with using shared facilities and to do to the best of our ability, make sure that, that transgender students' um, privacy and confidentiality is um, adhered to. Your board policy 0100 mirrors the educational equity regulation. That is that you also define individual characteristics um, as gender identity and expression. And then finally, uh, you as a local board adopted in August, I thought it was 2022, my apologies. It was your first uh, resolution in 2021 during the 2021-2022 school year uh, that the board supports the decisions of students for gender expression including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to the gender they consistently identify 
and the right of individuals to be addressed by names and pronouns corresponding to their gender identity. So that members of the board is what is on the books, both in board policy, uh, as well as in state regulation, state guidance, and the board's own resolution. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Is there any discussion on Ms. Howie's presentation? This is for a member Frempong. Go ahead, Ms. Frempong. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Howie, for the presentation. Um, so just to make sure that I'm clear. So all of these things you were referencing, things from Maryland state law from 2015, and I believe also some federal law as well. And so Baltimore County Public Schools as a local entity, um, while we may have policies and things that are more specific to Baltimore County, um, we cannot do anything, of course, that is um, against or different than what federal or state law has created, correct? So let me just make sure I answer the right part of your question uh, and, the, and correct some of your premise or refine some of your premise, uh, Ms. Frempong. The 2015 document from the State Department of Education is named as guidance. It's not named as state regulation. However, uh, given that the MAB case that came in 2018 was directly at odds with the 2015 guidance, what that uh, demonstrates is that the 2015 guidance was consistent with the way the court ultimately uh, ruled on a Title IX gender identity, gender nonconforming case. So if we decide or if the board decides that it wishes to go against what the federal court has decided or what MSDE has uh, issued in terms of guidance that's consistent with federal law, uh, that is done at the board's peril. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This is Mrs. Harvey. I just want to clear. I think I have the same clarification <laughs> that Ms. Frimpong uh, just asked. Maybe I need to hear it a different way. Okay. Uh, we have Title IX, which is law. Yes, ma'am. Then there's the the uh, the Fourth Circuit Court that had a ruling related to a Title IX case around gender identity and the use of uh, locker rooms. This all me. Am I understanding it correctly to say that our policies should be in alignment with those rulings? And if we are out of alignment with those rulings, then we are basically not in compliance with the law. Is that so what I'm hearing? that's what you're hearing. But actually, I did not address the Fourth Circuit case. There is another case that is out of Virginia that went up to the Fourth Circuit. Um, uh, certiorari was denied by the U.S. Supreme Court, so it's now law of the Fourth Circuit, and Maryland is part of the Fourth Circuit. I did not address that case because I didn't think it was necessary, given that we have a federal district court in Maryland, uh, a case that um, specifically looks at uh, Maryland local boards. But yes, ma'am, as to the ultimate um, takeaway, the takeaway is that uh, the law that is uh, has been the way it's been interpreted in Maryland concerning adherence to Title IX is that gender nonconforming transgender students must be permitted to uh, use the facilities of the gender with which they identify. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions from committee members? Okay, based on our discussion, does the committee wish to proceed with a further review at this point? Madam Chair, can you be more specific or further review of 0100 or what? Yes. Oh, well, I, do we need any? We don't. We, do we need? Are we? Do we believe that? Do we think that 0100 is clear based upon this discussion and based upon um, Ms. Howie's presentation? Or do do we think that there needs to be anything that needs to be addressed at this point? I, I'm hearing that it's clear, but I wanted to verify that before we move forward. I believe it's clear. Okay. I believe that it's clear. Okay. Thank you very much. I do as well. This is board member from Palm. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I think we're clear here. Um, and our final item um, is Committee General Good and Wef Welfare. Um, the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business and there has not been, as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. Does anybody have anything they would like to discuss at this point? This is board member from Paul. Okay, Ms. Frempong. I did send an email, so I don't know how. I just wanted to, I guess, provide notice or see if what is the process as far as looking at reviewing a policy that has recently that had come through PRC and had revisions done to it, um, but then we did not have the opportunity to have additional research and things done before um, a vote and things things came up. It seems like there was some more information that um, I guess should have been and made aware. Um, or discuss prior to making a decision. So I don't know what the proper process is for that, but I didn't want to bring that up. Ms. Howie, do you have some guidance on that? Did you see Ms. Frumpong's email by any chance? I'm sorry, I didn't. I apologize. I did not see Ms. Frumpong's email. Okay. Uh, I can bring it up now if that helps. So apologies because I sent it, I think, just to the chair and vice chair of the PRC oh, okay. committee. I, I can forward it to Ms. Howie as well. And I can just take a look that at the you. But if there's a request to review any policy um, in the same way the committee has reviewed other policies that are not necessarily on your 8130 list, um, that is simply a committee decision. Um, as to reviewing a policy or further discussion discussion of a policy. OK, so would it be appropriate since this um, I'm just unfortunately I was busy today. I'm just seeing this email. Can we just um, and if Ms. Frempong is OK with this, can we take a look at the email and then um, I, I can let you know that we need to add this to the to a future to our list for future policies for review? Is that appropriate? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma That's fine. Is that OK, Ms. Frempong? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other any other comments from committee members? OK, seeing none, um, the next meeting of the policy review committee is scheduled for Monday, December 11th at 430 PM. And because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, committee members. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.